Welcome to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production between the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. My name is Mark Bonica, and I am an assistant professor in the University of New Hampshire's Department of Health Management and Policy. Today's guest is Sean Stevenson. Sean is a Senior Vice President for Operations with Genesis Healthcare and responsible for Genesis's 110 skilled nursing facilities in New England. Sean is also an alumnus of the University of New Hampshire and holds a degree in Health Management and Policy, which is, of course, my department. So very excited to have Sean on for this month's guest. In this interview, Sean talks about his journey in the long-term care field and all the rewards and challenges that it presents. Sean and I both share the opinion that the long-term care field is underappreciated for the opportunity it represents to young people who are interested in a meaningful career in healthcare. The full interview runs about 90 minutes. I've produced an abridged version that runs about an hour. This is the full-length version. If you'd like to listen to the abridged version, please see our website, healthleaderforge.org, for the link. Also, if you enjoy this podcast, won't you leave us feedback on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or wherever you may be accessing this recording. It helps other people discover us. Thanks for listening. And here is Sean Stevenson. Welcome to the podcast, Sean. Thank you. Great to be here. So, Sean, you're an alumnus of the program I teach in health management and policy at the University of New Hampshire. So what drew you to UNH and specifically what drew you to HMP? Funny. So when I was a senior in high school and I was deciding, I at the time thought I wanted to go far, far away and actually went to the University of South Carolina for my freshman year. Went down there and thought at the time I wanted to be a phys ed major. Okay. And just was going a totally different direction. Both of my parents were in education. My mother was a um, special education director and my father for 30 plus years was a middle school principal. So I was really into the education. Ultimately, what I discovered was that both of my parents were actually in leadership positions in education. Okay. And I think that's really how it ended up. So did you play a lot of sports? Is that what the interest in phys ed? That was, yeah, that was a big part of it. Yeah, I was a, uh, I'm a three sport varsity athlete at Pinkerton and Derry and was really into football and lacrosse and basketball. And so I wanted to go to, uh, you know, something, you know, something there and just really just loved you know, coaching and volunteering and all that stuff, for, you know, for the little, the little kids in town and did those programs. And then I went down there and this was a different time. This was 1991 and there was some right away, there was some big culture shock changes for me that I experienced early on. And, and in the end, look back and wonderful learning opportunity mm -hmm. and eye-opening to what's going on out there and a lot of positive memories and, you know, great memories there. But ultimately, it was not home and I just didn't feel right, didn't feel in place and started doing some research about what else was out there. I, I started after I took a couple of courses um, in South Carolina that were geared towards phys ed. I started to um, have a change, change of heart and, and started looking into things around leadership and, and some opportunities and um, looked obviously at UNH. And I had several friends and some relatives who had gone there and I had friends who were there at the time. And all I was hearing was how much that they are enjoying it and getting out of it. And, and I just started at the end, I went up there for a um, winter break and I, I did a tour and, and checked out some buildings and I was really into the um, leadership majors. And I looked at it and said, you know, what's this health management and, and policy thing. And that opened up some more research. And at the time I was thinking actually managed care, you know, managed okay. care was, sure, was, was just starting to get right? there. And it was yeah. like, you know, Harvard and mm -hmm. 
Pilgrim and Tufts mm -hmm. and all, all these you know, these programs. And I thought that sounds kind of kind of sexy and mm -hmm. you know what that would bring as far as opportunity. And I said, all right, I'm going to apply for this and. That's it. So um, I transferred uh, sophomore year. So I started UNH fall of fall of ninety two. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you came to HMP into HMP. All right. Right away. So right away. Got right in. So did the program? How did you get interested? In, you didn't. I, I I don't know. Did you go directly into long term care or did you do managed care after all? So so this is funny. I'm just going to be as I always am. I'm just going to be straight up. So I had no interest in <laughs> long-term care yeah. when I was a sophomore at, at the time. I was told, you know, at the end of your junior year, you're going to have to have to do an internship and all that. And I said, okay. And I, I, at, at the time, I was thinking managed care the whole way and was really set on that. And I went to one of the optional nights to hear about some um, different sectors. And there was one gentleman who talked a little bit about long-term care. And I was kind of, yeah, that's interesting. That's not exactly what I thought. But at the time I was taking a general, a, you know, whatever they call them, a, a discovery, um, a gen ed, gen ed or whatever, kind of um, which was intro to social work. Okay. So I was taking this class and this is where I joke around and I'm just going to speak the truth. There was a actual requirement to volunteer somewhere for eight hours as a part of passing the class in social work. Now, um, this professor at the time had the handouts of everything and there was this sort of lottery and everything. So long story short, I missed class when they handed it out because okay. I had had a really, really fun night at UNH uh -huh. the night before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I missed class. And I came back in the class and he said, Sean, you have the only one left that nobody wanted. And I think it speaks volumes still to, I think, why I, I've been spending so much time at UNH and talking to juniors and seniors and really letting them know what this really is and what the opportunities are. And, and I'm, I'm taking a lot of pride in that. So I got this 215 bed county nursing home, Riverside rest home with the gentleman, Ray Bauer, who, and it's in Dover. Mm -hmm. And I had to volunteer there. And so I went in first day, miserable. Didn't, I had this sort of like stereotype in my head and I met with the first thing I did was meet with the administrator and he was immediately. And I think that's me today. It just had this extraordinary amount of pride and energy and, and just passion about the industry and, and where it's going and everything it offers. And he sat with me as a part of my volunteer and it was probably about an hour just hearing about that. And then he took me on this tour and then he had me volunteer for a little bit with uh, recreation and activities. And then I went and I spent some time with nursing and he convinced me to come back even over and above, you know, what was required for the class. And I ended up never stopping and I just volunteered there for the remaining three years at UNH and he was my inspiration and got me excited about the business and I just never looked back. So what was it that, it, you know, during those initial eight hours that, you know, bit you that, that created the bug in you to, to want to come back and keep I think, going? Think, I think what it really was, was obviously the leadership aspect as I went into one of his morning meetings and saw he was at the end of the table and he had all of his department heads and everybody had different responsibilities and he was asking and he was directing and challenging and helping advising. And then just with the walking around and meeting with staff and talking to residents and really seeing his relationships. And ultimately it sounds corny, but I've always just said that it's, it's the, it's the excitement and the diversity of every hour 
but at the same time, you truly go home and feel that you're actually helping people and that you're really making a difference and in people's lives and life and death and quality of life and, and um, quality at the end of life and really just making a difference. And at the same time, if you do well and you're good at it, you can make a pretty damn good living on it too. So. Those are not too nice, uh, a nice combination. Yeah, right? absolutely. So, so you graduated. Uh, did you do your internship with? I with did the, at Dover. I okay. did. Nice. I did absolutely. And so you graduated, and what? Were, where did you head? You know, out of out of uh, school. Right, right. Yeah. So I always remember with my buddies and everything in the um, uh, uh, Lambda Chi Alpha there at UNH in the fraternity house, and we made this. We had this whole wall because back then everything wasn't on computer yet. You know, we all mailed in your resumes and you waited for that letter if you're going to get an interview or a phone call. And so we had this whole wall that we called the uh, the wall of shame, where it was just all all the denials and the <laughs> sorry, you know, we're not hiring right now, we're not interested. And I was just relentless and just went after every single nursing home in New Hampshire that I could find. And to just to give me any opportunity just to get my foot in the door. And so I um, nailed a great gig right after graduation with a 150 bed facility to be their business office manager is how I got in. So that was that was May of 1995. I, I think I took off maybe three days after graduation and jumped right in. Okay. Yeah. So uh, uh, where was that? That was in um, here in Bedford, right okay. down the street, All right. which, what are the odds, is now a um, Genesis facility. As, At the time, it wasn't. Okay. But it was, uh, yeah. So I- So business manager, uh, what, what was that role? Yeah. What's so role? so this was, this was also a 150-bed uh, facility. So you were basically responsible for cash collections, billing- collecting and also you ran the um the resident bank so nursing homes are actually required to have a an actual bank for for them so they can come in and not have to leave the building but they can come in they can deposit money it has to earn interest and they they can take out cash and they can deposit cash and then in the business office we could actually write checks for them and help pay their bills out of, out of, out of their account. Wow. Okay. So, yeah, so it was great. So I got the whole resident interaction. I got the family interaction for, you know, new admissions. I would, I also was in charge of overseeing human resources. So they did payroll. So I was able to get in with staff and payroll and benefits. And I just learned that whole kind of back office mm -hmm routine right away, which was really cool. And I had no idea what I was doing. I had <laughs> never managed anybody. Right. And, and I had a, a department of uh, three people Yeah, and just, just jumped in. So who, so you were a traditional student, like you were 22 at this point, thereabouts. So yeah. That's a lot of responsibility for a 22, young person, right? Right. Yeah. So it was. were you mentored by the administrator? Yeah. So I, I think that was a big part of it. Why I actually got the job, probably really couldn't say that now, that he was discriminating or something based on my age and everything else. But I think he was a younger administrator. He was probably 25 or 26. That was his first building as an administrator. And I think he felt, you know, I, I got to give this guy a chance, just like somebody gave me a chance. And, nice. and at the time he was so young, I look back and I wonder if it was sort of the blind leading the blind, but... <laughs> We, you know, we did it together and I'm still in touch with him and he's a friend of mine today and he's at a different building. He's running a county home now, but he's really good man and always grateful that he gave me the chance. Was that an independent facility or was that a part of a chain? No, it, it, it was a small New Hampshire, very, very popular New Hampshire chain at the time, McCurley okay. Healthcare, McCurley's, mm -hmm. yeah, which, which uh, Forrest McCurley passed away years ago, but Forrest was a big, big supporter of um, UNH mm -hmm. and the HMP program and um, and also Lambda Chi Alpha. He was a uh, Lambda Chi Alpha brother. So he helped me to get the interview to get this job. 
Okay. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah. So, so from the business office, uh, at what point did you move into leadership? So when, so in order to become a, a administrator, you have to go through an AIT and an administrator in training. So when did that come into your career? You do. So I, I was just one of those, um, some call it, um, persistent. Some would just call it, it's absolutely annoying. I was one of those, I am going to get an AIT and I am going to get it now. So I, that, that was something that I really pushed when I took the job as a business office manager. Like my goal is to be an administrator. And, um, at the time I was hoping I would get it at that building with some oversight with somebody from, um, the organization McCurley. And I could see early on that it, that it just wasn't going to happen. And so, but at the same time, I said, I have to stay a year and do the right thing and learn and do what I have to do. But while I was also getting my name and my resume out there to get hired as an AIT, um, administering training, New Hampshire required, and they still do, hasn't changed. It's actually very antiquated, but that you have to do a full 12 months of an administrator in training formalized by a, you know, preceptor and all, all the paperwork and all that has to be done. And then you take your boards and you take your exam. So I ended up getting a position as a business office assistant to help, help collections while I could do an AIT simultaneously with another company that was in Manchester, New Hampshire okay. called, uh, at the time it was integrated health services. They were a big, big chain at the time. And Hackett Hill was the name of the building, which ironically now is also owned by Genesis. Okay. So it seems like some, you know, like the <laughs> like Genesis you came back through and bought took a- <laughs> over New Hampshire. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I got my AIT after a year, that was uh, 1996. After one so year, t- talk a little bit about what is what is an AIT for folks who aren't familiar yeah. with it, and you know, what are you trying to? Right. What, what are you? What it, what is it you're learning, and why is that a requirement of the industry? Right. And so, great question. So, I I take a lot of pride in what even with with all the UNH students I talk to, and ultimately who we give the summer internships too. Um, they just started. We have two right now from UNH and um, really trying to give them sort of a mini AIT in the summer, which is hard because it's only three months mm-hmm. compared to 12. 12 yeah. But what we really try to do, and I should go back to that in a minute, because I didn't really have a great administrator in training experience. It was more of what I made out of it with the, my engagement and the questions I asked and, and just wanting to learn and wanting to get it and volunteering for things and being on different committees and teams and asking if I could go attend that meeting and doing things really. I didn't have that really necessarily motivated teaching preceptor, which mm-hmm. is why I'm very careful with where I put the UNH students, because I want to make sure that they have a great experience. So long way of answering your question, I, I, you know, I think it's so important that you truly see every single position in a building and, and to see how it all comes together and how it all impacts the patients. It all impacts the experience and all impacts the bottom line and the business and really seeing how it all works. And um, so that's really, we also have full-time AITs, which we actually just hired two, two UNH grads as, uh, um, as full-time AITs. I'm very, I'm excited for these two young ladies. They're going to be really, really good. They did their summer interns with us last year and they made such an impression that I said, stay connected and then we just hired them full time. So they're both are coming on, but it's really, you need to go and spend a whole shift with a CNA and see what they do and how hard it is and how demanding it is. And, and you know, what we ask of them and having 
10 patients to take care of in a seven and a half hour time frame, And also, yeah, take a break and have lunch and get everything done and make sure the patient's very happy. You need to go and spend time on the tray line and see how you read every person's diet and make sure they get the right food on their tray and make sure it's not something that they're allergic to and, and all, all these different things and get exposure to every single department. And, um, one of my favorite quick stories, it was one of the UNH interns last summer when I went in to check on them and she goes, I just have to tell you, Sean, I can't believe how hard housekeeping is. <laughs> and she, like, she just, it was so eye opening for her yeah. and what she saw that they have to clean in eight hours you, you know, dry them up and wet them up and talk to residents and do all you know, trash cans, all, all these different things while still being friendly and smiling and doing everything you're supposed to do. And I just said, someday she will be an administrator and she's going to walk around and she's going to look at every housekeeper and have total, total respect for them. That's, that's what an AIT should be. Yeah. After you do all that, then obviously, then you spend time with the administrator and then you learn leadership skills and decision making and the accounting and everything else but first see how it all works yeah um before okay, we're going to talk more about kind of higher level leadership in, in a large organization like genesis but i do want to spend a little bit of time talking about kind of the individual facility so um mm -hmm. uh kind of thinking generically about a about a skilled nursing facility a nursing home can you kind of describe the structure so you've talked a little bit about like dietary and but what are, what are the kind of main moving parts yeah so as far as kind of what makes up the engine mm -hmm. right all all the all the different parts of that so what well, really obviously is the operator so that's the administrator who kind of makes it all work together and all that and i would say close to pretty much equal partnership in that is the director of nursing those it's predominantly a clinical nursing environment and care care delivery and it's really at the end of the day it's most of what the product is so that's a really really um, important piece you've got obviously the business office and and the finance port all all your accounting and your um, accounts receivable accounts payable that whole department you've got uh, therapy. So you have your rehab department, PT, occupational therapy, speech therapy, that whole piece. Recreation slash um, therapeutic rec, some call it, or in some buildings, it's just good old activities because people need that kind of leisure and social interaction and all those other things outside of the clinical model. You have social services, social work that really helps with um, discharge planning, safe safe discharge planning, making sure that people are in a really healthy mental state. People, you know, we deal with a lot of depression and a lot of anxiety because of what's happening to them clinically. You have family issues, domestic issues, so you need social workers for that. That's important. And then um, clinical reimbursement. So Medicare, Medicaid billing and all that and how we capture what patients are getting and their needs and and then housekeeping, mm -hmm. laundry, mm -hmm. dietary and maintenance. Okay. Taking care of the property. So hopefully I didn't forget somebody and this doesn't go public <laughs> and I'm I'm never going to hear the that's end a, of it, but yeah. that's that's really it. So but so as the administrator you are actually over the whole thing. Yeah, you oversee all that. Right. All so you have to understand how all those pieces interact. And exactly. Yeah. Okay. You, you're never going to be how I kind of put it as, as an administrator, you're never going to be an expert in every department, but you're going to know just enough to make it dangerous, <laughs> you know? And obviously as you do it more, you get better and better at it. So you start to figure out some real solid medical terminology. You start to know what it means clinically when you hear things and, you know, morning report and, yeah, it's just experience. At the end of the day, that's what that's what gets you there. Yeah. So when did you take 
your take responsibility for your first facility? When did you become a, the right. administrator in charge instead of the administrator in training? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so I, I always remember when I when I got the job, I had finished my my training. I took my boards and passed. And there was this building that was in Claremont, New Hampshire. And so it was out there. Yeah. I lived in Concord with my wife and I got the offer. And it was really funny because it was one of those. I was so excited to have my first building. And I remember, so the guy called, he said, Sean, I have a building for you. Claremont, New Hampshire. I think it's a good step. I said, I'll take it. I didn't even wait to hear what the salary was. I didn't even negotiate or anything. I was so excited to have my first building. And he says, well, shouldn't I tell you what it pays first and all these, all these things. And I, and I remember my wife and I just jumping around and, um, and we were celebrating. So we went to this really fancy dinner at, um, the 99. All right. <laughs> that was, that was it. Let's go. You know, yep. now we're, now we're big spenders. Let's do it. So we did that. And, um, I was actually 20, 24 years old. Wow. I was 24 years old and um, I always laugh because my father got me for graduation. This is when you still had those like like the real wood leather briefcase with the clips that opened and everything. And so he gave me this briefcase. It was his father's and then it was his and then he gave it to me. Nice. And I remember going to Claremont and I walked in and I had my briefcase with me. And it was empty because <laughs> I, I, I didn't know what I was doing. And so, I mean, maybe it had a pen in it and maybe like an apple or something and that was it. And, and so I walked in and my director of nursing was 66 years old and I was 24. 24. Okay. And I was her new boss. Yeah. I always remember that. Yeah. And she was absolutely amazing. Yeah. Taught me so much about the business. That's a, you know, um, uh, I mean, I, I didn't know much about long-term care coming out of the military. We were chatting before. So my career prior to coming to UNH was in the military, you know, but one of the things that has impressed me about the opportunities in long-term care is that they're similar. They're the most similar in my mind to the level of responsibility that a young person gets going into the military. Just, I mean, at 24, you were in charge of right, this right, right. facility. How many beds was that? This really was um, 68 beds. Okay. So, 68 bed facility. Yeah. So you're responsible for the lives of 68 people. Absolutely. At 24 years old. Yes. And this was a, this was in a different reimbursement time where we were getting much better Medicare reimbursement. And so this building had a in-wall oxygen in wall suctioning and had a whole entire ventilator unit which was basically like almost like a med surge unit at a hospital it had complex trachs complex ventilators people were either on ventilators there and living there long-term care and we're going to be on a vent for the rest of their life or people were also weaned off a of vent and then actually went home and it was crazy complicated and i remember i can't believe that i'm actually responsible and overseeing this place because it, it was a little at the time it was very overwhelming <laughs> how many staff roughly typically For, you know it's funny really with how it works out it's typically that normally around what you have for census i don't know why it always works out that way okay. but that's usually about what you have for staff so i had about probably probably 70 75 staff there well so in charge of 68 patients, um, 75 staff, you're 24 years old. Right. So what was that like? Well, it was one of those, I think you, um, you learn by, by experience, you learn yeah. by mistakes, yeah. you learn the hard way. And I think by probably my biggest thing when I look back on it was, and I still remember this now today, is that as a new leader, you tend to lean towards, you want everybody to like you. You want to be liked, you know? And, and I think as, as I learned that, that just with the odds, if everybody, 100% of the people working in that building like you, then you're not doing everything that you're supposed to be doing as the leader. And 
I tell a lot of our young administrators that now to say, not everybody is going to like you, right? But that as long as everybody respects you and that you are constantly trying to breed loyalty, that's, that's what you want to get to. I think I kind of learned that the hard way in the beginning mm -hmm. where not enough coaching and development and not enough accountability to poor performers and, you know, mediocrity and all that. And I think it was more just being popular and being liked. So not enough holding, holding those people responsible for yeah. not performing at the level they should be. Absolutely. Well, that'd be hard. Absolutely. I mean, you're 24, you're probably one of the youngest people in those, the building, right? Absolutely. No yeah. doubt. Yeah. That was a big part of it. Yeah. That was a big part of it. How do, how would you, I mean, how should young people going into that role establish credibility? I mean, especially, right. I mean, you're a couple of the young folks that you took, you know, Ashley and Monica are going right. to be right. trying to do that. And, That's right. you know, a year That's from right. now. You know, it's funny. So a part of it, and I'm sure there's all kinds of debate and all kinds of theories about this. And um, I've just seen this in my experience. And I'm sure that there's exceptions. I always look at, I feel that there are some areas that you can't teach. You know, you have it or you don't. And I think that's that's really what we figured out, even with like a Monica say, like, like Ashley, or even with these interns, I think that we picked for this summer and and um, that there are, there's confidence and there's um, transparency and candor and, and there's things, things like energy and passion. And, you know, it, it's a difficult, area to try to get people to see that and actually implement that. And you know, sometimes I think it's kind of how you're wired and who you are. But my, my biggest thing is, is for the younger leaders is one is don't get a big head. Always, always stay humble. You have to always stay humble and that it's really around clarity of expectations. People want to know what's expected of them. That right there is going to help you to get respect. It is going to help to breed loyalty. If people know what's always expected of them, that helps. If they're always guessing and I don't know if I'm doing the right things, I don't know, you know, all that. That's something I figured out, I think, early is that people just want to know what they have to be doing in order to be doing a good job. And then recognizing them for it a lot when they do it and then um, coaching and developing timely when they're not doing it. And I think that that's what people want. And those who I've seen through the years who are poor performers um, or just not maybe in the right fit or in the right job for them, they, they start to figure that out. It's not going to work for me here. And then they move on, yeah. I think. So. A couple other questions are kind of generically about nursing facilities. How do people come to be here? Is it, so, so there are probably a number of different avenues. So how do people come to be in, in a facility? The residents and the patients, you mean? Right. Yeah, right, not, right, not, right, yeah, right, right, right. Sure, sure. Yeah. So oh, there's so many, um, you know, so many different, different stories. I think there's... Um, you know, there, there's, um, and also so much of it sometimes is actual cultural too, you know, kind, kinds of residents and patients I see in Medford and Boston, Massachusetts compared to kind kinds of patients we see in Bedford, New Hampshire can be drastically different. Not, okay. not as much from, they say, um, always clinically because you're still going to have, you know, heart disease and pulmonary respiratory issues and dietary and, and of, um, you know, like diabetes and deterioration of different body, you know, systems. It's just more of, uh, there's also a lot of domestic issues. You know, there's folks that are neglected, unfortunately, you know, you have a lot of that, you know, where folk, folks are neglected and where they are. And then unfortunately found at some point, on the floor or they're found in bed, you know, they haven't left bed in two weeks or, mm -hmm. or you find just kind of normal 
caring and very, very loving and involve families who see things early on. They see mom starting to get forgetful. And so they start to think about maybe, maybe it's dementia and Alzheimer's. So they start talking to us about a potential, how are we going to handle that? You have folks who mom, you know, we're starting to see that she's walking a little slower and having a hard time getting out of her chair and getting back in her chair. And and all of a sudden they get a call and she's at the hospital. She walked outside on the steps and, and she fell, Yeah, you know? And so, I mean, we could talk for yeah, six so, hours about all kinds of different. <laughs> sure. Well, different so I'm thinking things. about the broad categories of your, of your residents or patients. So you've got long-term care, because yep. we were just walking the facilities. You've got a yeah, couple yeah, of different yeah. broad care, sure. like long-term care. You had a kind of an intensive long-term care. Um, yep. Yeah. Rehab. So maybe talk a little yeah, bit about, yeah, sure. about those. So, yeah. So obviously um, on the short stay rehab side, you're getting much more in into the therapy focus. So okay. there's a lot of occupational therapy, physical therapy, some speech to help them with their swallowing and their eating and all that to be able to get them to that next level when they can go back home and, and um, get to where, where they used to be or where they really need to be to be able to have a good quality of life at home. So I think a lot of folks who <clears throat> don't understand the, the business, don't understand that you're not just doing long-term right. kind of uh, that's right. custodial care. That's right. That's right. So how do people come to be in a rehab here right. as a rehab stay? Yeah. So um, it's typically after an acute stay at a hospital. So most, most of the time it, it's, it's a night that's in the emergency room and then they're moved over to a typical kind of a med surge recovery for honestly nowadays two or three nights and after typically 48 to 72 hours at the hospital they're ready for rehab um a sniff as they call us you know a skilled nursing facility and get over there and and uh we we get going right away some cases it's not always therapy. Sometimes they're dehydrated. So we have highly clinically capable nurses who will do do the IVs. We do pick lines and TPN, hydration, nutrition areas. Um, we do a, uh, like I said earlier, we have um, ventilator care, trait care to get them into, into that next level around their breathing and get them, get them in, into a better place. We have um, wound healing. Okay. There's a lot of cases where folks will discover that mom or their, you know, whatever has developed some um, pressure areas because they're just not moving and they're not on the right diet. And so they develop, you know, pressure areas, uh, go to the hospital. We take care of them after that to get them on the right beds and on the right therapy and on the right nutrition program. And we get them home. And okay. like, like I was telling you earlier, we're doing in some of my buildings. I have I have a building, Hathorn Hill, that's in Danvers, Massachusetts, that we do close to about 110 to 120 admissions and discharges in a month. Okay. In and out, in and out, in the building for probably seven days, maybe ten, and then going home. So these are not people that are staying the rest of their lives in your not at so all. Not how at has all. that changed in your career? It's changed a lot. It's yeah. changed a lot. Um, so when I started, it was more that traditional long-term care, much more of that Alzheimer's, dementia, some mental health, a little bit. And then we'd get short stay rehab, but short stay back then was like 40 to a hundred days. So really, cause that's a, a lot of it was based on what the Medicare reimbursement system was okay. and that they really almost encouraged that to really make sure that they got their whole Medicare benefit, that they really had a total safe discharge and it really focused on getting you to the maximum level. And then you went home. Maximum level of health. Exactly. Of recovery. Yes. Okay. And your capabilities. Okay. And now it's, now it's more of value-based care, cost-effective, high quality care, but being more more responsible so quick stay quick stay at the hospital get them to that next level get them over over to the sniff quick stay get them back home home health care and whatever we need for follow-up and that's it wow. 
And now we're finding, which is I'm sure we'll get into, is is our whole other struggle financially is that now it's even we're being in many occasions passed over now to just going right home. So straight from the hospital back yeah. to the house. We used to get six or seven years ago, if you went in and you were 67 years old, you go and get a new knee and get a new hip, you would come and stay with us after that after that surgery for a month and, and get therapy. Now, if you get a knee or hip, you go home. Yeah. You don't even come here anymore. A couple days in the hospital then, and then straight to the hospital. Yeah. Yeah. It's, nowadays, it's even one night at the hospital. In a lot of cases, oh. it's one night. Yeah. And you go home and then you get your therapy and home health and home therapy and all that and you just do it. How has that affected your business? It's, it's, <laughs> um, we should have done this at a bar. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a, um, it's really, um, affected our business where now it gets into a whole other area, which is really around Medicaid reimbursement. So, okay. which is really long-term care reimbursement, obviously for folks who, who have spent down. Yeah. Typically in our industry, you see anywhere from 70 to 70 to 80% of your customers are state Medicaid. It's a, for for the most part, it's not nearly what it should be as an adequate reimbursement system for what the cost of care is. Yeah. Historically, Medicare patients would basically, you know, we used to basically call it a, um, it was a supplemental to help cover what, we were losing on all of our Medicaid residents. So what's happened now is now you have much shorter length of stays on your Medicare patients. So now instead of 30, 40 days or 100 days, now they're going home after seven or 10. So now we need to try to make that up and just get that many more Medicare admissions. Well, the Medicare admissions aren't as frequent anymore, as I told you, because now they're going home. So now we don't have that sort of that that Medicare clientele help to be able to supplement the Medicaid program. Mm -hmm. So it's tough out there. Yeah. It's tough out there right yeah. now. And that's why you're seeing and seeing articles and hearing of buildings closing and buildings selling. And, and um, also we're dealing with, I have never had more time of my job spent on, grassroots efforts trying to talk to and, and get FaceTime with with politicians to help us on the reimbursement end. Focused on state level, like, like Medicaid reimbursement rates? Yep. And just getting yep. something realistic? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. we were talking about rehab. So rehab is one portion of the yep. business yep. that I think a lot of folks don't really pay attention to. Right. Then you also have other kind of- Yeah, so you have your kind of- Traditional long-term care, which is okay. basically really at the end of the day, it's really easy. It's it's that they they need twenty-four hours, seven day a week, um, for lack of a better word, uh, um, supervision and um, assistance. So you wouldn't be safe living at home alone for a twenty-four hour period, and so that could be anywhere from not knowing exactly what times and what the right medication is that you should be taking. Could be just can't get in and out of bed. It could be bathing. It could be um, toileting. All those kind of activities of daily living that we call it. So, yeah. you know, brushing your teeth and all the little things. And then not saying that, you know, it's all in, in different portions of that. Mm -hmm. So it's not like Everybody in a nursing home is getting help with all, all of those areas. It's just, it's typically one or two of those areas or more, mm -hmm. which then got them to us. You know, some we deal with bariatric. So where we use um, equipment, you know, for lifts and, and specialty chairs and specialty mattresses. So just long-term care. Mm -hmm. And then they get out of that to the whole socialization piece and the recreation and like I was saying earlier on our tour, we take pride in sort of in the fine dining and they have a lot of activities. So they're seeing other residents and they're getting 
that kind of group activity going, but they're also are getting one to one, one to one attention as well, mm-hmm. and things that they just wouldn't wouldn't get at home if they were living by themselves and. Families are busy and they have a lot going on in their lives and there are some that don't have any family. Right. And so that's kind of how they ended up with us. So it's up to you to create a whole quality of life. Quality of life. Yeah. 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 And then quickly, some of the other services we, we do memory support, um, and dementia services, you know, with Alzheimer's. So we have a whole other product for that and model is whole other kinds of programming. We, we really focus on from the minute that you get up until the minute that you go to bed that there is programming for you. And we have folks who take a lot of pride in that care and that. We have now, um, never thought I would be saying this, we have um, mental health and behavioral units that are much more in our urban areas, suburb Boston, suburb Providence, suburb Hartford, Connecticut, Hartford areas. We, we do mental health and um, our recovery. We are now getting into um, people who have a primary medical need, but also have made a commitment to recovery for substance abuse disorder. Um, that's what we're seeing now as the population is aging. We have folks and 50s and 60s and 70s who are, whether it be heroin or alcohol or different different substances, have wow. have made made a commitment in a hospital system. And then we do a nice kind of handoff and a transition partnering with the hospital. So, Do you have specialized facilities or facilities that specialize in it's typically that kind um, of care or are they mixed in with the general population it's typically um a specialized unit a unit yeah okay within a building okay and uh yeah we do that and then we do um assisted living we also have a couple independent living buildings as well independent living apartments where we do um dining for them and then we offer some different shopping trips and some things outside but all yeah. that too. So yeah, we're kind of, we're all over. Wow. We're all over the map. What's the difference between assisted living and skilled nursing? Yeah. So assisted living has also, has, has rapidly evolved as well. It, it, it's, um, it used to be much more into a more social model and, you know, dining and activities and just not having to wanting to deal with that at home and get yourself a real nice apartment and know that you have you know, restaurant style dining and you have a bunch of things that are going all day for you if you want to do that. And we still have some of that, but it's gotten much more into a clinical model where, and it's not as highly regulated mm-hmm. as long-term care and sniffs are. Mm-hmm. So you can get away with a little bit more. And, and so there's a lot of medication administration, medication assistance now mm-hmm. that you see at assisted livings. Mm-hmm. And, and there's different kind of levels of care now that you're seeing even within assisted living. So it's, it's changing. Where's it's the, changing. Where's the dividing line? And is that a thing that's like at a state, state by state? Yeah, it really is. It really is. It's really um, state by state. And it's also your kind of your company philosophy as well, because obviously as you get more clinically complex and you get in, into more labor and more staffing and more expensive to take care of patients like that. And, but most of it is more geared towards kind of regulation and what the state says that you can do and can't do. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So you were a, so let's take back to Claremont. So you were a young, young person in Claremont working uh, at your first facility, first building. How long were you there for? So the company was Integrated Health Services, IHS, and they were a multi-state, large, large corporation. They had three facilities in New Hampshire, Claremont, Manchester, and Derry, New Hampshire. And... They, I was at Claremont, I want to say for probably, a, probably about a year and a half. I really felt very 
loyal to the company. They had given me my AIT. They had given me my first building. And at the same time, I was from Derry. I was really young and married and wanted kind of like a nightlife and other things. And Claremont's a small town for people. Claremont's not for us, a small town. People from, and, not from New Hampshire. <laughs> we lived in Concord and my wife was working oh, okay. for a, um, funny, she was actually working for an HMO okay. at the time. And so Manchester opened up and I called my boss immediately and I said, this is, this is perfect for me. And he said, absolutely. You know, you've earned it and had done a good job at Claremont. So then I went over to the Manchester facility, ran that for a while, and then Derry opened up and I kind of presented this idea at the time to my boss, knowing I wanted to get to that next level. And I had started to kind of like, like to figure out early on that I can get buildings exactly where we want them. And then I'm kind of ready for the next building to help fix it and kind of turn it around and get it to a better place. And so Derry was having all, all of these challenges at the time. I said, well, it's the same company. Why don't I go to Derry and I'll help us out? And I said, but I have an idea for you because I've already run Claremont and I've already run Manchester. Why don't I come over and run Derry, but have me supervise those two administrators and I'll just take care of New Hampshire for you. And they thought that was interesting and said, you know what, that, that makes sense. Cause my boss was in, he was out of state and had to travel to come up to New Hampshire. And I said, you know, it's, I'll still report to you, but let me, let me cover New Hampshire. I know, you know, intimately know the build, well, the buildings the three, right? and the markets yeah. inside and out. I know, you know, the hospital players, I know the community, I know, I know the staff, I know the department heads and let's do that. So they said, all right, well, let's do it. So let's go oh, for it. Okay. So that's when I first dipped in, into multiple facility management. Well, what was that like stepping up to that level then? Interesting. It a, was a fairly was, good distance. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But it, but it, I really enjoyed the, just being able to kind of mix it up as much as I really enjoyed running a building. It's nice to be able to say, Wednesdays or Thursdays, I'm going to be go, I'm, I, I won't be here and I'll be visiting my other building. And it was kind of nice just to get kind of mix it up a little bit and get some time and, and, um, and just help, help the administrator to kind of think through some of the challenges they were having and problem solve and, and all that and, and still maintain the relationships I had already built when I was there and that was kind of cool to be able to go back and, and see people. And the hard part, and that's what I learned early was that not everybody is the same administrator that you are. Mm -hmm. And, so, but that doesn't mean that your way is the only way, right? Your way is, is the right way. You know, that, that doesn't mean that people have different leadership styles. And I had to open myself up to that. And I also had to, put away my own pride around what I had accomplished in those buildings and still trying to feel like they were my buildings because they weren't anymore. So I had to really kind of let that administrator run, run his or her building and let them feel empowered. And I was more kind of almost kind of like a consultant role to help them get through some things. Yeah. So you said you kind of, it sounds like you'd kind of developed a knack for making improvements and kind of seeing what needed to be done. How yeah. did you, how did that come about? Because not everybody's going to develop that. Why do you think you were able to build that skill set? Yeah, I think I threw, I think a lot, honestly, some things I learned um, at UNH. There was at, at this time, I was younger and I was working through also my master's program and doing that at night and doing, doing the online thing. I was uh, New Hampshire College at the time and, and was doing all that. I was learning a lot from there and I was into this real, just really looking at sort of motivational leadership books. I was doing a lot of reading and trying to, trying to get some good ideas from that. And at the same time, I think it was just more my sort of just, my approach is sort of this more just kind of like street smart piece and just trying, trying, trying to keep it simple. Don't make everything so, so complicated. 
overanalyze everything and take so long to make decisions and make plans. And I really just tried to simplify it to get into almost, it's what I call just kind of like the API, right? It is let's assess what's going on here. Let's make a plan, implement the plan, and then let's evaluate it and see if it's working. And I still use that today. And also um, learn from just what my bosses and what my mentors had taught me about simple things like begin with the end in mind. What do you see here when you're finished and you fixed it? What do you see in every department that it's really running at its top, at its highest level? What's your vision for that? And say, so, okay, now let's back up and let's make our plan and how we're going to accomplish that. Let's get there. And I think in the end, there's also this just sort of this kind of, I'm laughing because people, we kind of, we make fun of ourselves and people make fun of me at work and, and it's just kind of what you do, you know, to have a little bit of a fun environment is it, it, it's also a little bit of my sort of my type A personality where I, I don't let anything go and I make sure that every box gets checked and I always make sure that we cross the finish line. Mm -hmm. and that things aren't just going to linger and aren't going to take too long. And we're going to do it right, but let's keep moving. Let's keep progressing. So you self-described type A. That must have been yeah. really hard to let go, uh, what you were describing a minute ago about letting the administrators run Very the buildings much. in their own ways. S still is every day. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So how do you how do you get over that? Well, I, what, I have figured out, and I think I did it as – as an administrator, you don't, you can build your team, you know, with people who do have at least kind of close to similar values and what I think is important. So I do try to build that team where I can look around the room and say, this is the team. These guys get it. I always remember when I was running buildings, when I was at Claremont, Manchester, and I definitely remember Derry because I left there where it was just at its highest level. I remember looking around the room and going, I could go on like a three month medical leave or, or a vacation, and this building would absolutely completely run itself. That's when I always knew that I was ready to take on the next building or take on a new role because of that team that I built. So you were supervising three facilities in New Hampshire for IHS. Mm -hmm. How long were you with IHS? So that would have been uh, 97 to 2002. Okay. So five years with IHS. Okay. Yeah. And uh, and then you moved over to Harborside Healthcare. Harborside Healthcare, yeah. Okay, in 2002. And, and so what was the role that you took on there? So that was my first regional vice president role. That and that really was. I would I would no longer be running my own building. I would just have buildings administrators reporting to me, and I didn't have to run a building at the same time. That was my first kind of regional, multi, you know, multi facility role. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just how many, how many buildings? So it was just an over a perfect ge geographic. perfect transition. It, it yeah. was it was this they had decided that they were going to break it up. Harborside said, okay, let's just get somebody who knows New Hampshire. They only had six buildings. They said, let's hire a regional vice president for uh, the six buildings. Well, it, it was um, Bedford all the way to Keene. Okay. So Bedford, Milford, Peterborough, Keene. And those so areas. So all along the southern, kind of the southern yeah. border. And of course, my wife and I had bought a house about a year earlier in Durham. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Which is on the far which eastern is way side. On the other right. side. So you're so, going from east all the right. way to the Vermont border. Yeah. yeah. Okay, got it. So I did the job for six months to make sure I was going to make it. And they were happy with me and I was happy with them. And so that's when my wife and I moved and we've been in Bedford ever since. We moved to Bedford. Okay. Wow. So you had six centers initially. Six. Okay. Yeah. And so for how so what was it like letting having to let go of the of of owning a facility? Yeah. I mean of of managing a facility. It, it was I actually that was probably um 
uh, the easiest uh, move because I had already done sort of a couple other buildings at the same time, so I could handle that. And I was I was at a point where I was ready to not have my own building. I almost didn't even really want to do it anymore. Okay. So I was really really okay with it. You yeah. Know? Why? Why? This, what was what was it that you were kind of like? I kind of feel like yeah. I hope this doesn't come across um, in the wrong way as 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 like arrogant or anything. I think it was more that I just felt like I had kind of done it now already three times and fixed buildings and got them to these great places. And I kind of figured it out Mm -hmm. and I was just ready to take on some different challenges. I just felt like I got it down. You know, I I just really didn't have to do it anymore. At at the same time, when I took this role as the regional vice president with Harborside, there was already this well-established regional team and I walked into the room and I could tell I was dealing with the same thing that they were all looking at me and they're like, who is this, who's this young guy? Yeah. Cause I took that role when I was 29. Yeah. I was 29 and, and I just walked, you know, and I walked in and had, had replaced um, somebody who was going on, on to a different company and he had been in the business for probably 30 years. And so I think they were like, who, you know, it's sort of like the same thing, which is why I, I always, kept saying to myself and somebody taught me that it was probably my father was let's just always stay humble stay humble just listen and learn and respect people and you know and and from all levels of the organization be the same to everybody and i stuck with that and i still do and i think it helps hopefully you saw that you know when we were walking around that Mm -hmm. i just talk to everybody it's not about titles and you you know, you, that's just really what you do. Yeah. So, so initially you were, in, you know, for Harborside, you were in charge of just the six buildings in New Hampshire, but eventually mm-hmm. you had a larger portfolio. I did, yeah, yeah. So we got New Hampshire rocking and rolling and really improved systems, and we put in all, like, the company policies and procedures, and we got everybody aligned towards the same same goals and really got into a real – positive recognition environment people were really feeling good turnover improved people were staying with the company and ultimately the bottom line grew substantially and so they were having a lot of challenges in uh, massachusetts and rhode island harborside was and so my boss I remember when he came and talked to me and took me out to to this dinner and and basically said, you know, we'd like you to take over Mass and Rhode Island. And, you know, and that was, I was petrified. I was, I was really scared because I've never operated in a different state. I only knew New Hampshire. Yeah. That was a big, that was a big move. And why is that important? It's just. I mean, aside from physical yeah, distance. What, what's yeah. That? It's just, there's so many cultural differences and they're all great. You know, it's not like any is better than the other. There's just so much more to learn in different States. You know, you've got, um, you know, New Hampshire doesn't have big cities. It doesn't have Boston and Worcester and, you know, and, and, uh, Rhode Island, it was right outside of Providence and you've got different, culturals we had a building that was a lot of you know portuguese we had a building that was um a lot of um haitian we had um different um different arrangements buildings in mass a handful of them were um unionized i hadn't experienced anything around unions and you know, well relationships and union negotiations and potential strike preparations and, you know, relationships. And then you've got the whole reimbursement system. So you have to learn how does Medicaid reimbursement work in Providence? How does Medicaid reimbursement work in Mass versus New mm-hmm. Hampshire? And Because Medicaid, for folks who don't understand, Medicaid is a state Medicaid level state level. Program. That's right. So it's going to be different depending it's on the state. all different. All and then different. regulation as well, right? At yeah, the yeah. There's not, not as, as much. much okay. As much. There's some little little funny little things like, you know, reporting procedures and different expectations, but you can figure those out relatively quickly. But, um, and then 
the other difference is, is just really knowing your markets and, you know, New Hampshire, I could, I could call the CEO of Parkland Medical Center in the hospital and go at breakfast with him twice a month. I could call even, you know, Catholic Medical Center and we could get together once a month and have lunch. You're not calling Mass General and, <laughs> right. yeah. and you know, even Rhode Were Island you? Hospital <laughs> and getting and getting breakfast. It doesn't, it's, you're a, yeah. you're a real little fish yeah. in some of those states and some of those markets. So it was a huge adjustment for me, a okay. huge adjustment. How did your leadership style have to change kind of as you expanded that, the number of, of facilities you were overseeing yeah. and kind of having moved away from actually leading a facility to just leading the leaders of facilities? Yeah. How did your, how did your leadership evolve? Definitely. It's kind of a simple answer, but it was just focusing so much more on leadership, on my team, on my leadership team. All of a sudden I went from six buildings to 16, I think was the first move. Maybe it was like 18 or something, but, and all of a sudden I've got 18 direct reports and I have a whole entire regional partner team that also reported to me, which was probably six people, you know, therapy, nurse, you know, all that. So I had a 24 direct reports. I could have like six buildings and say, we have, um, we have a census and a revenue problem at a building. I, I, I could go in there and spend a day and, and sit with the administrator and develop a plan, really focus on census and have a whole plan. And then I, I could monitor that. Not as easy when you have eight, 18 of them. It was more that, okay, now I got to really focus on, I need to make sure I, I have the best administrator running each building. And it's hard because you can't just walk in and say, okay, yeah, you know, you're not going to make it. All of a sudden you have like a mass exodus. You can't do that either. So you have to have that whole like sort of assessment time to really assess people and get to know them and teach them and develop them. And, and then you figure out, you know, what do you have for a team? So definitely I'm a big adjustment while at, at, at the same time, I had to educate myself, as I said earlier, on all the different different markets, states and markets stuff, and everything yeah. else, just kind of figure all that out at the same time. Yeah. Cause you have to, I mean, if, so if you had a, uh, a facility that is servicing a particular population, like you were mentioning, mm -hmm. some uh, uh, some ethnic ethnic population, it's a different. There are different expectations. Is that where you? Yeah. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. And yeah. A different way of marketing and convincing people that this is the facility you want to come to. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. And also, not just residents and patients, but also staff. Okay. Sure. You know, yeah, if you're drawing from the same right. community for exactly. your staff, it's yeah. a different, a yeah, different when expectations. I would, uh, so let me let me fast forward a little bit. You so you were at Harborside, um, expanded your 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 area of, of responsibility. Then Harborside was acquired by Sunbridge. Yep. In two thousand seven, you got an even larger portfolio of, of yep. facilities. Right. And then Sunbridge was was acquired by Genesis in two thousand twelve. Right. So yes. kind of uh, so that's when you came to actually work for Genesis, who, who's who you work right. for today. Right. Um, so what was that yeah. like going through this kind of series yeah. of scary, acquisitions and scary. what's Yeah. So it's, so it's funny. So I actually kind of joke around where I say that I'm a cat and I have nine lives because so far I've, I've been through probably, you know, with these acquisitions and now <laughs> I've been through three. So I'm uh -huh. like, okay. So if we keep getting acquired, I must have six <laughs> left because I keep surviving okay. these acquisitions. Cause I have been through where through all these Harborside to sun, sun, son to Genesis, I've, I've seen close coworkers and friends get, get laid off and yeah. not, not keep their positions. And, and, um, so at Genesis, I technically have a tenure today because through the acquisitions, you didn't quit or leave. So they keep your original date. So I technically can say that I have been at Genesis for 17 years, but I haven't, Right. you know, I've been with them for seven years. But it's, it's a, it's total, you have to open your mind and to be, you know, to learn what their culture is and company culture, values and missions and everything else and get to know people and give them a chance. You know, that's, what we're, that's really what I've learned is, and it's also scary because you want to make sure that you're going to make it. Yeah. And so, so it's a lot of that, that you have to. 
I felt every time that I would, I was starting over and that I, I had to prove myself again and, and I had to develop relationships and get to know people again in a way that sticks to my values where I'm not going to brown nose and kiss up, you know, here to my new company, but just show them, show them what I'm about and get to know them and hopefully it all works out. So you were a regional vice president when for these two acquisitions yeah. up to about 25 facilities. Right. And then in 2012, was this, when were you promoted to senior vice president? So, no, I, so I was with Genesis. Genesis bought us in 2012. Okay. So this was a little later. I was still an RVP with Genesis, had to prove myself again. And then at the end of 2015, I was then promoted to um, senior VP. So, so it took me uh, 13, 14, 15, and it took me about three years to kind of make my mark at Genesis. And, and then I got this opportunity. So you are, a and this is VP. what you're, you are a senior VP for operations at Genesis for New England. Yeah. And you oversee 110 centers. 110 buildings. Wow. Now. That's <laughs> a lot crazy. of buildings. I mean, I, I, I can wrap my head around 16 buildings. 25 yeah. starts to stretch my limits of my imagination. 110 yeah. is kind of like, I don't yeah. know. Like, like, so how do you, what's that like? What, what, as crazy as it is, it doesn't change a lot. It's because it's still the same where now I have a regional vice president team. So I have nine direct reports, okay. you know, they each have, you know, a certain amount of buildings, do the math, but they, so, and I have built that team already to, I have a really strong regional VP team and that is on my bus, but it's funny. You really start to see as you as you go into each level, you almost feel in your own way less empowered. You can't influence as much anymore. Mm. You know, it's more high level. It's, it's really high level around, you know, what, what, what I call kind of our kind of major operational areas. It's what I call like the five C's. So I have, you know, clinical, clinical services and quality, census development, cash collections, controlling labor. It's our number one expense in order to run the business. So controlling, all meaning labor. controlling labor expense. Yeah, which okay. gets into a whole other, how do you do that? It's, you know, turnover and good hiring, you know, retention and staffing to budget, you know, mm -hmm. all, all kinds of different things. And then really just the overall customer experience, customer satisfaction. And so it kind of changes where, I can't get into the details at a specific building anymore, you know? Now, I have a handful that I have to, you know, are on my sort of Sean list. Okay. And one does not want to be on the Sean list, I assume. N no. Not necessarily. <laughs> right, right. It's, and I, you know, my goal is, is to get them on a project plan, get them turned around, and then we kind of graduate them off, off of the Sean list. Okay. You know, that's kind of what we want to do. Yeah. But I've learned that you always are going to have a Sean list. Sure. That, you know, that's the business. It's what we talked about earlier where it's so cyclical. You're always going to have a little. But getting back to your question, it's more of that it's just what you have to prioritize and what you want baseline implemented in every center, what, what I have to have in, in every center. And then more of trying to help my RVPs around their specific challenges and their portfolio, what we have going on. How standardized... Uh, our facilities in the Genesis system. Yeah. Like, like how, how much is, I realize the physical buildings are going to look differently, but I mean, how much sure, is the sure, management sure. kind of standardized down through the system? Yeah, it's, um, it's a great question. I think um, it's funny because my boss, our um, chief operating officer, the COO, is doing a great job. He, he is really focused on getting Genesis into a much more national model standardized model mm -hmm. of really trying to say that there are like certain baseline expectations and processes and systems that we should have in every building. And so a Can quick example, example yeah. of that. Sure, sure. Um, a, a simple example. Well, the easy one is clinical. You have to do that anyways, just because of our own liability. It's, you know, if, it, if we're not following 
our standard processes around how we handle IVs or what we do for a new admission assessment, everything everything a nurse asks a family and a new patient. We have to have that standardized because we want to cover everything, make sure that there's no stone unturned and that we capture everything that the patient will need clinically. Maybe a different one that's more company kind of choice and optional is census development. Let's just say to try to build a business, make sure that every bed is full. Mm -hmm. We have a sort of, we are implementing a, um, a key account management process. So we were, every building has the same tool and has their kind of key local contacts that they need to be reaching out and have relationships with. So like hospitals to and help. Yeah, exactly. Hospitals, okay. assisted living. Points of referral kind of. The rotaries, the, okay. you know, like the chambers of commerce and just having those kind of relationships. Okay. So okay. that's kind of an example of what we want standardized. At the same time. And that's the job of the local administrator to make those contacts. And absolutely. Okay. absolutely. So, there's an, so there's an external facing kind of function to it being an administrator. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. There's a whole piece, yeah, that we didn't even get into. That's really kind of, kind of the sales and marketing. And you are, you look at nursing homes, not to get off track, but it, in most towns, they are probably one of the largest employers in the town. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you figure, you know, like you're normal mom and pop town or whatever, you know, I mean, if you're a hundred bed facility, which is our average, and you know, you're employing a hundred people in that town. That's, that's pretty big. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's not Manchester or something, but right, it's, you right, know, but, a, but small most town. Claremont, you know, right. you were, you in the hospital, you were a yeah. pretty big employer. That's yeah. right. And so you, you should be out there as, as a community leader and knowing people and being involved. Okay. Absolutely. Do you have metrics, kind of a dashboard of some sort that you track? I mean, I would think at all your that level. is definitely um, company standardized. We have every report that you could possibly imagine for mm -hmm. all those areas that I just mentioned around yeah. clinical and census and cash and controlling labor and customer satisfaction. We have reports for everything. Is that how everything. you how you manage your 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 facilities? That I mean, because. Yeah, so at a high you're not, level, you're not, yeah. Yeah, so at a high level, it's typically, you know, how you compare versus versus your sister centers, how you compare versus, you know, your budgets and your targets mm -hmm. and um and and industry standards, that you know, that piece too. And it's funny you say that because a quote that I say all the time to people and it and it drives them crazy. I'm um, in jest, I always say, the numbers don't lie. <laughs> The numbers don't lie. Right. So if your if if your census report says that you're running eighty five percent occupancy, mm -hmm. and your county runs ninety one percent, and your budget is eighty nine percent, what's what are these numbers telling us? Right. We have opportunity to grow census. We're not, you know, we're doing something wrong here, or, or we have opportunity here. Right. So. Right. What's a day in the life of Sean Stevenson look like? So you say you live here in <laughs> well, Bedford. I do. Um, I do. Yeah. But yep. you must spend an awful lot of time on the road, I would imagine. I do. Yeah. So I typically do um, Mondays and Fridays are definitely office. Just got to, you know, hundreds of emails, catching up, making sure everything's in the works. Things are going to cross the finish line, projects, conference calls, all that all that piece. And then typically Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, you know, for the most part, I'm really trying to hit the field. So whether it be visit buildings, not always, it could be um, meetings for state um, associations, definitely meetings with politicians, what we call C-suite meetings. So I'll meet with hospital systems, healthcare systems, you know, some ACOs, some um, all over the place, just that kind of piece, which is more census development, you know, relationship building. You know, I, um, I sit on, on a couple boards and that kind of stuff. And, but really my favorite is getting out and actually visiting buildings. But, uh, yeah, there's some driving. There's not actually a lot of overnights. Um, it's nice to have New England. Well, it's New so England, it's mostly right? yeah. manageable while I try to 
I get up at probably 5 a.m. and I get my exercise in and then I, I, I try to do family time at night and try to balance that. It's um, not unusual for me to have to take probably a few hours on, you know, Saturday or Sunday to try to just make sure I'm, I'm staying sane. So I'll sit at the laptop and just make sure that I'm staying ahead of the game or at least keeping afloat. Mm-hmm. So just to do that actually helps make sure that you're feeling good yeah. going into Monday. Yeah. So yeah. a little bit of that, not complaining, yeah. just, yeah. it's just kind of like the reality to, to answer your question. Okay. Yeah. So you mentioned you report to the COO. I do. The yeah. corporate COO. Oh, I do. Okay. Yeah. So this Genesis got about 500 facilities? Um, we're, it's more now, we've done some recent um, divesting okay. in some uh, uh, California recently, Texas. Um, so we're probably at a, just around 400 now. Okay. Just around 400. Yes, yeah, so I have about, you know, 25% of the portfolio. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. they're so the company is pretty invested in New England. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you could say that. Yeah. <laughs> right? okay. Yeah, I guess so. Okay. Um so what's the rest of the corporation kind of look like? So you've got a mm-hmm. how how yeah. do you interact with the rest like do you have a you have peers, I assume? I do. I how do, do you yeah. interact with them and how yeah. do you interact with kind of the leadership? Yeah, yeah. So we have a um so so one of the Tuesdays, I'm actually on a plane to uh Baltimore just for the day, you know, for a, um, um, a senior management meeting and obviously run chaired, um, by the COO. That's when I get to see my peers, um, which is great. Obviously nice to be in the same room with people that have your same challenges and, and can kind of relate to your world. Um, we do that monthly. Genesis obviously has, it, it's, Genesis Healthcare, but we have other divisions or other service lines. So we have Genesis Rehab Services, GRS. We have um, GPS, Genesis Physician Services. And then we also have a whole Genesis Career Staff line, which is a whole contract labor temporary staffing agency. Oh, interesting. Okay. As well. So there's a lot going on. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot going on. So we are all kind of part of, you know, we get together and and, um, work on more company, big picture type of, um, you know, initiatives. So we talked, you know, quickly about this consolidation that, or or the number of times that you were were acquired. It seems like, in my observation, that there's a lot of consolidation happening in in long-term care. Yep. Um, is that accurate? Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's a, um, it's kind of has its highs and lows, right? It just, it kind of goes. And, and again, it, it sometimes it really depends on, on the state. Like I said earlier, where there's so much going on around Medicaid reimbursement and there's a lot happening there. There are newer companies that are coming and, and, there's some um, investment firms who want to get into the business. And so there's a lot of kind of younger organizations who are coming out of New York City that are, are trying to get into some different states and do some acquiring. And and then there's some that are obviously selling. You know, we're constantly reviewing and evaluating our portfolio and looking at to see if that's where we want to be, if it's where we should be, and are there places right now that we're not that we want to be? Are there places where we could really get get a whole market share, you know, where we want to do that? And so then we can kind of get creative and do some different service lines. So it's not, I don't get as much into that as far as my role. I get involved just to kind of give my own advice or my own input or I may get a lead on something and I'll let people know but we have have departments who takes care of all that Mm -hmm. yeah I mean strategically speaking and broadly speaking it seems like this ought to be like a bonanza time for long-term care we uh I mean the population is aging I mean particularly in New England we've got some of the oldest like per capita oldest states New Hampshire and Maine are two of the top, I think. Um, mm-hmm. And yet it seems like most most long-term care organizations I'm aware of are really 
struggling financially. Mm. Is uh, is that your observation, and and why would that be? Yes, I would. I would say high level. I think we are just starting to take the corner as an industry. Not saying Genesis as as an industry where we feel that there is going to be a real pickup in demand in census. We really, studies will show that we kind of hit this sort of like the Great Depression, you know, where it really was at sort of bottom. And that really 2000, 2019, more so 2020, we're really going to start to see that there's going to be more and more and more need as far as our services. It's two issues with that, right? It sounds great. It's like if you were, all of a sudden, if you were whatever, if you sold, sold, uh, I don't know, peanuts, and all of a sudden you heard there's going to be all these elephants are coming, right? You know, <laughs> right, that, you right. know yeah. that's wonderful. Um, but so here's the thing is what they can pay for the peanuts is that's the challenge. So we talked about it a little bit earlier. So yeah. Medicaid reimbursement, that's, that's, that's where we really are in the sector, that's where we're having our biggest challenge, where it's just, it's, it, it is, it's not adequate. Now, not in every state, but most states, it's not adequate to, never mind just try to, you know, never mind actually trying to make a little bit of a profit, but actually even just to cover what it costs to take care of a patient on a daily basis. You know, Don't Massachusetts has an example, just yeah. use Massachusetts. Yeah. Well, hold on. Let me kind of get back to that. Yeah. And so what the other part is, so that's kind of one is really the reimbursement. And then two is that we have a significant in most markets, Northern New England, you mentioned Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont. Mm -hmm. We have a major staffing crisis. We are short of licensed nurses, RNs and LPNs. They're not there. <laughs> they don't exist. And also with certified nursing assistants and therapists, mm -hmm. physical therapists, occupational therapists, definitely speech therapists, caregivers, caregivers. We have an, we have an absolute staffing crisis. So what does that mean? We have to pay more. It's expensive. You know, you have to be able to pay for those folks in order to be able to compete and get people from other places. Right. And also in the meanwhile, you have to pay for premium labor, contract labor, traveling, traveling nurses. You know, we have nurses right now that are in Vermont that are from tech, you know, are from Florida or are from Texas that we pay a premium to, to be there for. You've got to house months. them as well as housing, pay their, all right? that kind yeah. of stuff. So and it's, it's a premium. Yeah. So it's almost, it's kind of like, it's like a perfect storm because people are going to be coming or, or people want to come are going to need the care. And, but one, our costs aren't, aren't being covered to take care of them. And two, we don't have enough people to take care of them. And so, and so back on the Medicaid state system, as an example, Massachusetts has been one of my number one focuses lately for the past couple months, because it's budget time and they're getting ready to finalize a Massachusetts budget. And we've been putting a full court press on just educating politicians and talking to them, their current system is our reimbursement is based on what our costs were mm -hmm. in 2007, 12, okay, so 12 years, years ago. Yeah. Do you know how much things are now <laughs> versus 12 years ago? Never mind paying for an RN right. or paying for a CNA. It's, it's absolute insanity. And so right. if you do the math, if, if they're paying us $50 a day for each patient less than it does to cover the costs, it's not rocket science. That's why you're seeing in Massachusetts, all these buildings are closing. Yeah. Even at 2, two or 3% inflation, which we've had low, low inflation, mm -hmm. 12 years at 2% is a lot of, it's a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you're spending a lot of time knocking on trying, doors. Trying to get creative around labor. Okay. That's the first thing. So yeah. how can we care for patients in, in the best way, but in different ways? How do we get into 
creating our own. And, and so as an example, like training your own people. So, so we've so. started a whole entire Genesis curriculum to get people to come in, get paid to take the class and become a certified nursing assistant. And we'll actually pay you to take the class. And then once you pass your tests, it's a six week class. You get your CNA license and, and then, you know, we give you a raise and then we give you an assignment and now you get a job and now you have a career. And so, because if we sit there and, and just expect that every CNA is just going to walk through the door and just want to work for us, it's not going to happen. So we're trying to get, how can we get creative to try to actually create labor or think differently? And another example would be um, telemedicine. Yeah. You know, that's something that we're really pushing for uh, legislatively and in D.C., more kind of federal level to see how we can get creative. But for for physician services, it's hard to find doctors who want to come in and, and take care of our patients. Never mind to be on call and get phone calls at two o'clock in the morning because somebody fell and had an accident or whatever, or we have a new admission coming in on Saturday night and we need a doctor to give us medication orders. So we are, we've signed up now with a company that does telemedicine. So we'll, so we have an iPad that's on each nursing station. And after five o'clock, if anything happens, you get on the iPad and you log in and now you have a doctor that's talking to you on the iPad. You know, you walk in and and you meet the patient with the iPad and you and the doctor interviews her and answers questions and then the doctor tells the nurse what to do. Okay. Well, it's creative. Yeah, because right, that's a great example. I was going to ask you about technology and whether you were able to employ, if you're employing technology to try to offset some of the costs of labor in particular. Yeah. Well, one of the other examples is what I showed you when you saw the um, the electronic health record that was there with the nurse, you know, so getting rid of a lot of paper, which is very time consuming. So that's another example, but there's a lot out there yeah. for technology. You have to pay for it. Right. And it's kind of one of those things, long-term care where 70% of, you know, your, your revenue is Medicaid. You're not in a position where you can be affording the, the state of the art technology that's brand new that'll help you get there yeah. so it's kind of you know like when you get like this new and exciting five fancy d flat screen television right it's always so expensive in that first year right and then all of a sudden then there's a new one and then that one is gets marked down by 50 yeah. percent it's kind of kind of the world we're in where even with the technology we have it's probably or what we purchase, it's probably already behind. So as the Senior Vice President of Operations for New England, what keeps you up at night? What keeps me up at night? Well, some of it is the role and some of it is personality. So some of it is just, it's my own issue to make sure that I'm covering everything and that I'm successful and that I'm doing all the right things and I'm not risking anything to take care of my family. That's always, that. that's kind of more kind of like the pressure I put on myself. That keeps me up at night. You're not a therapist, so don't worry. This isn't a therapy session. <laughs> I was thinking, <laughs> you know, maybe I should get a couch here and, right, right, or maybe we should go back to that bar the that bar, I was talking absolutely. about earlier. Yeah. Um, is it just between you and me and everybody on yeah, the internet? That's right. Yeah. yeah, that's right, yeah, that's right, yeah. And then I think the other thing is more of really just of the making sure that we are are really truly doing the right things and that we're we're taking the best possible care of people and giving people a, a real great experience and that nobody's at risk that's always you know it's always a fear just being in, in the business, whether you worry that somebody will elope and put themselves at risk or somebody will have a bad accident or whatever. And that's really making sure, that's really my thing is making sure that we're in a good place and that we're doing the right things for people. And I can honestly say that I feel, feel very, very good about that. Yeah. I do. And that's, 
that's Genesis, really. That's not a commercial. That's that is one reason why I am absolutely loyal to to Genesis. Genesis wants to always do the right thing by by the patient. Well, let me um, let me just transition. I've got a couple of questions about leadership that I want to ask you, and one of those is kind of corporate culture. Um, so, kind of transitioning from what you were just talking about in terms of you know what what the company sets out to accomplish. What is corporate culture and why, why is it important and how do you try to influence it as yeah. a senior leader? Oh, corp, corporate culture is, it's so important. It's, it's because you know, you get up every day and you want to make sure that you're, you're in a comfortable place and you're working there for the right reasons and that people are aligned and, and you're on the same mission and it, it really meets your values. I mean, that's, you know, that's one of the things I'm not, you know, I won't get into the, some of the companies I was with don't even exist anymore. And, you know, I have been in, in places in other companies, not Genesis, where I've gone home and looked at my wife and said, I don't think this is the right culture for me. I, I feel that our, our priorities are off and that sometimes, you know, I use the term sometimes profit before patient, you know, and, and, and I've experienced that not necessarily maybe with companies, but maybe with bosses in some different environments. And, and that's, that's, you know, you go home and you feel lousy. That's, that's, that's not a good feeling. That's what, that's when you got to get out. Yeah. And I think, um, that's what I have just really, even from the very first day at Genesis, I just, I just really enjoy the people and people get it and really, like I said, just do the right thing. They always want to do the right thing. And that's, that just mean, means the world to me. Well, how do you try to, so you are a, one of the senior leaders in the organization. How mm -hmm. do you try to shape that in the 110 facilities? Yeah, yeah. I, well, I, I think really, Ultimately, it's how you craft your messages, it's your delivery, it's, it's what you focus on, it's what you always have on the spotlight as, as the senior VP. It's how you conduct yourself when you visit buildings. It, you know, what kind of example am I setting? If I walk into a building and I sit down with the administrator and all I do is look at the financial statements and I say, thanks, thanks for the time and get up and leave. You know, what are my values? What's the company culture? It, that's, you know, that's not it. It's, I always walk in and I don't even look at anything yet. And I ask them, how are you doing? How are you feeling? How's your family? How do you like it here? How do you like Genesis? What, you know, what can we do better for you? How can we make you more successful? What are your career goals? Talk to them as the leader. And then I say, come on, let's go walk around and go and shake hands and kiss old people. You know, that's what I do. You know, like, and I look at people in the eyes and I get down to their level in their wheelchairs and talk to them and give people hugs and hold their hand while we're walking down the Alzheimer's unit to make them feel good. And, and those are the things that, you know, you set the example and what's important. If you could kind of encapsulate your leadership philosophy and what would it be? Oh boy. I think it's, um, well, you probably heard it a lot today. Mm -hmm. I think is really, you know, just totally, totally respectful, um, caring and compassionate, uh, you know, uh, work-life balance, very, very um, important. Um, but clarity of expectations, so there's no surprises. Recognition and celebrating and developing and coaching. And I think that's what people would say about me. And I think I'm a big copycat person in all honesty i i do a lot of reading and my favorite is um one of my favorites is um jack welch okay you know and and i just think he's brilliant and he's written a lot of really good stuff and and um got a one in particular you'd want to recommend um your head? his book winning, winning. is okay. is winning is a um it's one of those you can it's kind of almost kind of like reference to like you don't even have to sit there and read the whole book he has different chapters of, of different leadership themes and challenges and things, you know, and he has this one chapter that that's called candor. 
mm-hmm. and about General Electric when he was there and how he realized it just was not, they were wasting so much time because people were not transparent and people weren't candid and that productivity was down so much of it and things took so long because people just didn't just speak what they want. People didn't say what they needed to say and what they had to say. And that was a big one. But there's a thing that I always look at where he talks about this whole hiring of people and when you build your team. And I kind of alluded a little mm-hmm. bit to it earlier around there's things that you can't teach. And he had this sort of, he had this kind of philosophy around that looking for people right away in the interview process and as you get to know them when you're selecting, it's people who come in and who have definite energy. Two, that they also show and that they have this way that they can energize others. Three was this, that they have a little bit of an edge, meaning that they will not they will not shy away from having to make tough decisions or having to have tough conversations with people. And then four was that they show passion, that they just have passion for, you know, for everything they do. And, but he tells this great story that he was like, but he still wasn't moving the needle along. Like it was getting a lot better because he was building a team with all those. But then he was on the plane. He tells a story about how, but let's talk about, so this particular staff member and they have energy and they energize others and he has an edge and he has passion, but his results still aren't there. And so then they figured it out that they had to add this fourth E and it was the ability to execute, to actually cross the finish line. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was fascinating when I read it. And obviously it totally stuck with me because that's when I have, I have built my teams based on that. And, um, people, people have gotten better from my coaching of that, but there are people that just haven't worked out because they just, they, they just can't, they couldn't cross the finish line and things. And it's amazing how much that's really helped to, um, yield better outcomes. It's just, it's crazy. So yeah, I'm a big, big fan of that book winning. <laughs> All right. We'll, we'll yeah. put a link to it up in the, in the notes. Oh, great. Um, so let me, uh, let me, let me close. Cause I know you've got a meeting. Yeah, to absolutely. Go to. Yeah. yeah um, six minutes. So in six minutes or less for a young person thinking about a career in healthcare, why long-term care? Yeah. Well, that's an easy one because I give the speech to now probably 14 or 15 UNH students when they apply for the internship. Um, because, uh, when I started it three years ago, I had four people apply, I think. And then in the second year, we grew to 10. And then this past year, we had like 16 or 17. And I'm really excited about that because I think what's helped is, is that that the seniors who speak to the juniors about their internship experience, I think we've taken a lot of pride in um, Genesis with their experience. And I got an email actually today from one of the new interns who's already just really, really enjoying it. And, and she said, they're all like, I don't know if they're all Facebook or something, or I don't know, like they're all on something together and some of them are already talking about how bored they are and and that they're stuck in a cubicle Mm. and and she's like oh you know so far i've done this and i'm doing maintenance tomorrow and then i'm gonna go social services and everyone's kind of oh that's awesome so i think that's really cool anyways i didn't really answer your question but i think it's what i tell them is is that it's this sort of we know what the stereotypes are it's not like it's not sexy on the surface it you know but educate yourself on it, that it's not just this sort of, you know, little sweet little Myrtle who's in a rocking chair, who's working on her blanket and, and the place smells like urine. That's really not what it is anymore. And I get into the, everything I just talked to you about, all of the diversity and how every hour is different and the pace it goes at and all of the skills that you need to be successful at it, you know, with human resources and leadership and political science and, you know, 
sales and marketing and leadership, everything that, everything that we talked about and the opportunities that are, are, are going to be out there. My nephew is all excited about this hospital that you know, he's at right now. Great. Hope he continues with it and all that. But I will say to him when I see him this weekend is how many hospitals are there out there? How many hospital CEOs are there versus how many nursing home administrators and even nursing home regional vice presidents are there? Do the math. And, and so the, not saying that you can't make it as a hospital CEO, but it's tougher. It's hard. It's hard to get there. And a lot of hospital systems are going into a much more clinical leadership model now. So you're seeing more like the physicians are becoming the CEO. Right. right. And so it's even that much harder. Right. And so I'm just encouraging them on, if you get into a building and I've talked to them about salaries, you know, like you can come in as an AIT, graduate from school and and make, you know, 50, 60 grand as an AIT. You get your first building, you could be making 80 to 100 grand in your first building and, and uh, you know, and then you keep growing and the opportunities are endless. It, it, it's not about the money, but... It, I think with some of them it is, you know, sure. and so you explain all that, that you can have like this real rewarding, fast paced work environment that can be at the same time, you can make, make a really good living. So I think it's working around getting more people involved and getting more applicants. And, uh, we've hired a lot of, a lot of folks. I'm excited about, um, you know, what we're doing with some of these college partnerships. It's pretty cool. Well, we appreciate all the work you're doing with our students. So yeah. thank you. And thank you for taking the time to talk to me today about your career. And, and I've really enjoyed learning about more about Genesis. Same here. Yeah, it actually feels a little weird. I don't think I've ever done this. Where I actually had to talk about myself so much. It's like it's <laughs> a, my wife would really be making fun of me right now, but it's all good. All right. It was my pleasure. You've been listening to the Health Leader Forge a joint production of the College of Health and Human Services at the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Please go to our website, healthleaderforge.org, for more information or to leave comments about today's podcast. Look for Health Leader Forge podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and other podcast distribution sites. Thanks for being a part of the Health Leader Forge community and we'll talk with you again soon.